Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this discussion on thinking scientifically about process, philosophy, problem solving, and people too. My name is Oscar Roach. I'm joined by Mark Rosenthal. Mark's a regular speaker at summits and is the person behind the Lean Thinker website, for whom a lot of you might well be familiar with. I personally love listening to Mark. He joined me um, in some uh, a delivery of our we had a Carter program at the Austin Summit uh, last year, and uh, it was it two years ago now. It's hard to remember with all this COVID stuff. And I was a bit nervous about that, to be honest. I thought, how am I going to go with an expert like Mark in the room? But I really appreciated his, um, his the balance he provided and the feedback I got from the end of it. I love listening to what Mark has to say, but I will give you this little tip. Mark is one of those people you need to listen to really carefully because in amongst what he says, there are, there are gems. And I've picked up a few and used, there's one in particular that I use on a daily basis. But first of all, I would just like to start by referring back to this um, the slide you see on your screen, which is the 4P model that uh, comes from on page seven of the Toyota Way second edition. And Mark, if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is just read a heading that's on page eight, halfway down in the second edition, and then the first three sentences, just to get us started. And the, the heading is, it says, uh, scientific thinking is the hub, and we are not great at it. <laughs> I loved that line when I read and I saw it. Now, the net first three sentences, uh, the biggest change in the Toyota Way model in this second edition is placing scientific thinking in the center. This is not a new idea for Toyota. First TPS manual published by Toyota's education and training department in 1973, Port Ono's view of the scientific mindset. So Mark, tell us, what, are we, what did Ono mean by the, or what was meant by the scientific mindset? What's your interpretation of that? Yeah, it's a different question asking what Ono meant, because I have no idea, I never met the man. Yeah, yeah um, no, no, but, what's your interpretation <laughs> of the scientific mindset? It's, um, I, can, I tell a story. Uh, when I was uh, working at Kodak, I was driving between plants on a residential street and I saw a house that had signs in the yard that had numbers on them. And I'm thinking, what's that about? And then I said, huh, I wonder if it's just the house number. So I glanced across the street, looked at a mailbox and the mailbox was one off and said, that must be it. That's scientific thinking. I constructed a hypothesis. I saw something and was, wanted to understand it, constructed a hypothesis in my head, and then checked it out by running a quick experiment and tested it. That's different than the scientific method, which is a, you know, a very rigorous process. But scientific thinking really is just comparing what you think is going on with some objective view of the truth and being prepared to be proven just proven wrong. Uh -huh. and, so and if you have a scientific so if you have a scientific mindset, then what you're doing, I guess, by interpretation, is doing what you just described all the time. Yeah. By default. Yeah. Essentially yeah. by default. Yeah. It, mm. It's confirming what I think. Yes. Um, and if you look at the way the uh, the Toyota production system is set up. Everything that they do, their every one of their processes is constructed to reveal information about what's actually happening compared to some standard. And so even the shop floor itself is constructed as a as as hypothesis testing, which is really embedded in the in the thinking there. Yeah, I love there was a line in the Spear and Bowen Harvard Review article in nineteen ninety nine that says yeah. Toyota. Toyota, one of Toyota's aims is to develop a community of scientists. Yeah. Exactly. And I love that line. <laughs> and that ties in with, the, I guess that ties in, doesn't it, Mark, with the scientific mindset reference in 1973, that, that, that cross-reference yeah. to the um, community yeah, totally. of scientists. Yeah, totally. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to that 4P model that I uh, put up on the screen and is on page seven of the second edition of the Toyota Way. How does the four, and we've got a number of questions that have come in and from people who have registered. Admittedly, we've had 370 regos for this, which has been terrific. When I got these questions, which was last Saturday, Friday, we, um, we had 250 at that stage. So I've only got the ones that have come in since then. But we've had uh, a number and we've sort of grouped them together. So the first thing, uh, first question, 
Mark, how does the 4P philosophy practically apply? Maybe I'll put that up on, back up on the screen. And if you could just talk to that question, yeah. Mark, how does the 4P philosophy practically apply? Practically apply. Uh, I think we practically really kind apply. of, yeah, we really kind of covered it. Um, and, we, and, you know, if I look at the model, you know, it's, um, you know, people are the people, it's people who think scientifically. It's people who have philosophy. Process is a mental construct that people create and it's people who solve problems. So their people really aren't on an equal level with those other things because it's the people who do everything. Um, yes. So how does it apply, apply practically? It's that as we're developing people, we develop them to apply the philosophy. We develop them to think scientifically so that they construct processes that reveal what problems need to be solved, and we develop them to solve the problems in a methodical way. So that's so, how, so, yeah, go okay. ahead. No, no, go on, keep going. Um, so if you look practical application, that's what every single one of the so-called lean tools, if it's applied the way it's intended to be under the philosophy, is designed to help people understand what's going on with the process and help people solve the problems that are revealed. So in terms of the, what I understand you to be saying there is that really ha the, the, the 4P diagram has got the people in the bottom right corner, as we can see there. What I understand you to be saying is that while that there's certainly, uh, it, that allows a strong focus on people, perhaps um, an interpretation or a more accurate or realistic interpretation may be that that people quadrant really flows over into the other three. That's what I yeah. understand you to be saying. That's what sure. about the philosophy side, Mark? How does that, how does it, how does that people quadrant flow over and the scientific mindset, scientific thinking flow over into the philosophy side, well, long-term systems thinking? Yeah, you know, Jeff has long-term systems thinking, and systems thinking is part of scientific thinking. It's understanding how the pieces interrelate with each other, and is and. You know, the, and, and I'm just going to, I'm going to even extend a bit. If I, you look at philosophy, the philosophy of a company that's been around as long as the benchmark company we're talking about, they see beyond, or at least they have in the past, see beyond quarterly performance. And they're looking at where are we trying to be in 10 years? Where are we trying to be in 20 years? And they're so when I look at long-term systems thinking, I'm looking, I'm, I would be looking at what impact am I making on the world and am I making on my customers and is my general direction moving, moving that way. Um, and so if I have a long-term philosophy that has respect for people, I'm also bringing the people along in the long-term rather than looking at them as a, but there's a great quote from an article I was reading back in the very early days of Numi, uh, back when it was, you know, even prior to prior to it being taken over by Toyota, when it was just GM Fremont, and one of the team members there said his uh, his the first thing he heard in hiring orientation, and this was in the you know the in the late '70s sometime from the director of HR, was. We requisition you guys the way we requisition shop rags. When we're done, we throw them away. And long-term philosophy and long-term system thinking with respect for people is the exact opposite of that. Yes. It's interesting your comment on that. I'm reading a book at the moment about Sir Alex Ferguson, and there's a lot of Americans in this audience who may not be familiar with him, although he does have an apartment in New York. So Alex Ferguson was the manager of Manchester United um, uh, for 26 years, from 1986 to 2013, 27 years almost. And a lot of, yeah, he's, he's the most successful manager in, uh, in English football that's ever been. And he spoke a lot about that and, has, <laughs> and about the respect for people. And one of the reasons for his longevity 
was not was uh, was never to throw. People were never discarded. Essentially, they were they were trade and sold players and stuff. But those who offered the length of service and the and the, the, the commitment to the organisation were repaid with um, like you were just suggesting now. Yeah. So with that that philosophy thought again, are you is uh, uh, executive management applying a scientific mindset to to philosophy and other uh, to the long term systems thinking? In other words, are they planning two years down the track? And in essence, is that an experiment? I think everything's an experiment because I don't even know what's going to. I don't know. I have a hypothesis that the sun's not going to explode tomorrow. <laughs> But I don't know until I wake up whether that's going to be true. Uh, it's yeah. not likely. But uh, if I look at you know now we're now we're kind of getting into business philosophy. I I don't want to really go there because no. it's possible to have a, have long term systems thinking that is absolutely hostile to people and and be very successful company. There's lots of them yeah, out there. Right. So now we're getting down to whether your company has you know, ethics and morality or not. And that's probably, a, you know, that's trading a into a, a different topic. Yeah, and, yeah no problem. Um, Ms. Witt, who works for us in Vietnam, actually, coincidentally, she's, she's asked the question, um, what if, what risk, if the people aspect is missing in this diagram, what's the risk? If the people respect, challenge and grow them is missing, what's the risk? What's the risk? Uh, well, what do you want to happen? Uh, you're going to struggle to flow value to customers if the people aren't engaged in helping you do that. Uh, and you know, there's a, if you think of it this way, um, one of the things I say I'd like to say is, you know, as soon as your your the next problem you need to solve involves engineering versus just working on process itself, you reduce by two orders of magnitude the number of people who can help, maybe oh, more. Nice. So you know, if you as the leader think you have all of the answers and think that a handful of people have can solve all the problems, then you know, go for it. But uh, if your company gets bigger than uh, a few dozen people, that's gonna get really tough. Yes, okay, I understand. Um, so, and this leads into the second question, and it's relating to buy-in, and that, and there's been a quite a few point uh, people have submitted the, on this one. How do I get people to buy in? Yeah. Lois Quinn specifically says, uh, "Do you think that process improvement efforts can be used to shift management philosophy, uh, or does the first have to be buy-in?" So, perhaps if you can talk to that one, and then buy-in in general. How do we get people to buy into this diagram? This is a this is a this big model. one, um, you know, and now we're getting into uh, into into uh, psychology. Really, uh, if you look at the work of uh, you know of Everett Rogers, who wrote the Diffusion of Innovation, and this on its fifth edition now, and there's ton. I mean, we've been doing this kind of research on how ideas propagate through uh, through groups of people since the '60s, and probably actually before that. Um, how do you get people to buy in is a really interesting question because it implies that you can. Um, <laughs> the, and you got to look at who. So he divided, you know, any population tends to divide pretty well into five subgroups on a bell curve. And your innovators, the people who first bring the idea in, the early adopters, the people who say, yeah, that sounds great, let's do it, comprise typically, you know, they're maybe 15, 16% of your population. Uh, you've got 68, 70% in the middle. Yes. Uh, and then you've got, I hate the word that he uses, but I'm gonna use it because it's in the book, the laggards. But they're not laggards in the sense, in the emotional sense. They're just usually the last to adopt an idea. Now, what's interesting if you look at this is that the people who are on the left, the early adopters and the innovators, tend to be externally socially connected. They are the people who go to conferences, they're the people who read the books, they're the people who are 
who are attending this webinar, uh, there yes. are the people who are seeking out new ideas. And as you move to the right in that bell curve, what you get is people who are more internally connected and more connected just to their immediate social circle. They are not going to put a lot of credibility, people they perceive as outsiders. They will adopt when the people around them that they know adopt. Right. So if you want to diffuse it through the organization, the key for the change agents is to understand the social structure, understand the opinion leaders. Change agents are rarely the opinion leaders, except maybe in a startup, because they're not inside the organization socially. So when you're talking about the opinion yeah. leaders, you're talking about the opinion leaders in the middle of the bell curve. In the middle, yeah, because there was a great study they did, uh, you know, physicians adopting tetracycline back in the day when it was a brand new antibiotic, and it was a miracle drug at the time. And you had exactly the same diffusion. There, there were doctors who, in, in, there were this, oh, and there was overwhelming technical evidence that this was superior to penicillin in every way. And still there were physicians who did not adopt it until their immediate peer group did, or a critical mass of their immediate peer group did. So yeah, you just right. have, to, you have to accept that the, there are going to be people who are going to re not respond to you as a change agent. They're going to respond to others. So reach as many as you can and, you know, put your, put your effort to the people who are interested and don't beat your head on the wall as a change agent with the people who don't want to hear you. Yeah, I'm interested in that. Yeah, and that's um, I'm interested in what you said at the start a couple of minutes ago, five minutes ago, when you said that, you know, that, how do you first get buy-in? That's assuming that you can. So just explain that a little further. I get. I think what you're meaning by that is that you can't, you, you know, to establish, to um, aim for buy-in of the whole population, all of the bell curve ain't going to happen. That's what not you meant once. by that. Yeah, it's not no, at not once. at once. Uh, yes. So you know, mass education. Hey, 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 everybody! This is what we're going to do. Really, what that runs the risk of doing is energizing the resistance base, the people who are right. afraid of it, because people, as, as a great thing, a great quote from uh, Ron Heifetz, people don't fear change, they fear loss. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and he also, nobody turns in, nobody returns a winning lottery ticket, right? I was, I was about, I've heard you say that before. Yeah. I was about to yeah. say, mate, please, please throw in that lottery ticket quote. Yeah, so if you look at the things at the core of what people want out of life, and I'm going to go a bit to uh, Edward Ducey on this one. They want to feel competent. They want to feel connected to other people, and they want to have a sense of autonomy. Now, think about, as a change agent, how are your words and actions increasing those senses in people or diminishing them in some way? And everybody's going to respond differently. Yes. So... You said it. That also said in this, this this part of the discussion that there's that uh, that, fifth, that fifteen to sixteen percent of the early yeah. adopters, and yeah. as a case in point, it'll be a people attending this webinar. Yeah. So specifically, if given an overview, what's your advice to these people then that are attending this webinar? Because a lot of them will be people who are yeah. trying to get scientific thinking going. What is your advice then in terms of uh, you know working through that bell curve? Well, first, it depends on where your position is. If you're a line leader, it's a lot easier because people tend to answer questions the boss asks every day. So right. if you simply begin applying scientific thinking, applying perhaps the, the, you know, the structure of Toyota Kata, for example, in your day to day, day to day interaction with people, they're going to come along pretty fast because I know yeah, the questions the boss are going to ask in the meeting. Yeah. In um, other words, do it yourself. Do that it what you, that's what you're saying. Yeah, there. yeah. yeah practice, practice it yourself. yourself. Yeah, and influence. Actions people, speak right? louder than words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're a in a in the CI office, it's a little tougher. Uh, do it yourself, and then teach the people who want to learn that are embedded in the organization, and get them actually really good at it. And and again, this is a you know we really we're, we're talking about is changing the structure of interaction, changing the communications channels, changing what people talk about and how they talk about things. So this isn't, 
you know, there isn't an, an individual buying in doesn't do any good unless they're talking to other people the same way. Yeah. So, right. you know, find, you know, you hear about a model line, which is great. And model line is not something you do to, to demonstrate the power. A model line is something you do to learn how to do it in your organization. So that's the other part is find a place and just start doing it and let that run ahead of everybody else. But again, the purpose isn't to demonstrate. The purpose is to learn because every organization has a different social structure and there is not a waterfall project plan you can put together to deploy lean or Six Sigma or anything else. It's a major change. Yes, yes, yes. So just that, that model line, I love what you said just then about the model line. The model line is not there to, uh, to, uh, to um, kick goals to the organisation as such. The model line is there for people to learn. Yeah. I really like it's, that. And I'm it's, yeah. sort of not for, part of Go on. For the change agents to learn, because even if yes. I'm, you know, as an external consultant, I, I have a pretty good idea, but I have to learn how the organization is going to respond to this stuff. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go narrow and deep somewhere it's in order to see what I need to respond to because every day is another experiment. Exactly. So uh, rather than copying yeah. what others do, we've got to take the principle and philosophy of scientific thinking and see mm -hmm. how, and I lo also love what you said then, this is these gems that you come up with and you've got to see how the organization reacts. Is that what, yeah. is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. yeah, because people will respond differently. People and will respond put differently. In and that's why copying one, doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. If you put in one by one flow, it's designed to surface every problem in the organization. <clears throat> I mean, it's congratulations, you know, when you, when you put in a flow line and things get worse, congratulations, it's working. Yes, exactly. Um, good. That problem, those problems were always there. You just revealed them. So yeah. how fast do you do that, right? You know, we put a moving line in, in one organization, a moving assembly line in, in one organization. And we started by responding to problems that stop the line for half an hour or more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then over time got more and more, um, you know, finer and finer granularity until we had a true and on response system in. But if you put in an and on response right away, you know, I had a plant manager who was ask, 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 answering the question, how much line stop do you time? You know, how many line stops a day do you have? And he said, when we first started, we only had two or three, but they'd last for like four hours. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know? And, um, you know, when things were running, we had, you know, dozens and dozens, if not a hundred, but they were very short. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, Mark, this is, um, uh, we're gonna digress slightly, but we're not. Yeah. Going back to that model line, and let's make the assumption that the, <clears throat> that the people who are registered to this webinar are those 15 to 16%. One of the things I really love about, I heard you say uh, about 18 months ago, was uh, more than that, and it's on your Lean Thinker website, is how if you're consciously aware, you need to be consciously aware of a meta pattern. Uh, and that really what I understand you to be saying through that is we have a, you know, we have a model line yeah. and we become consciously aware of this meta pattern that we're practicing. In this case, with scientific thinking it would be the four steps of the improvement Carter. Just talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that conscious awareness and the importance of that and yeah. how we take that and tie it to the model line to see what happens, essentially. I think it was in one of Pascal Denius's book and I'd have to pull it up to be sure. So if I pardon me, to the, pardon to the author if I got the citation wrong, but one of his characters had a great, and I call this lean in 10 words. What should be happening? What is actually happening? please explain. Right. So the whole point is, how have you defined what should be happening? And how do you know what should be happening? And then how do you know what is actually happening that might be different than what should be happening? And then what actions do you take when you see a difference? This is back to the scientific mindset. And yes, okay. 
this is the purpose of standard work. This is the purpose of 5S. This is the purpose of all of, of Heijunka, of Kanban, of all of the artifacts of Lean. Um, this is what a statistical control chart does. It defines what we expect, even if we don't like it. This is what we expect to be happening, and it alerts us when, we, when something outside of our normal expectation occurs that we need to pay attention to. So all of the artifacts uh, back apply to that. And somebody asked a question of, to expand on the nobody returns a winning lottery ticket. I just wanted to answer that. You know, if, yeah, I, become, if I, I become a multimillionaire, I'm not going to give it back. It's huge change. I'm not afraid of change. What I'm afraid of is typically loss, but loss of status, loss of something that I'm comfortable with. So... Um, you know, the, the comment was people don't fear change, they fear loss. Nobody returns a winning lottery ticket. And again, that's from Ron Heifetz at Harvard. Thank you. All right. So back on this, uh, back on our diagram, the 4P model, I'll bring that back up. How does scientific thinking apply? Really, we've covered this to some extent. How does scientific thinking um, apply to people and leadership. And I guess Sean Shepard, thank you for your question, Sean. He's sort of added a bit of further to that. I'm looking forward to hearing about how you relate scientific thinking to respect for people. So perhaps just on that specific question from Sean, if you could expand on that. I'm looking forward to hearing on how you relate scientific thinking to respect for people. Ah, uh, so you think about that. I mean, it's it's such a. I'm, I'm trying to respect, challenge, and grow people. Leadership itself, when if you, and when you are not simply repeating, what you already know how to do. If you're moving into new territory, if you're trying to mobilize people to do things, it's a process. It's a, it is a process of experimentation. And it's the same structure. I've got to understand what are the dynamics in the organization? What do I play in those dynamics? Because I'm part of it. But I've got to be able to, to, to separate myself from what's going on and pay attention to the interactions, the patterns of interaction, and then say to myself, okay, what do I need to adjust in those patterns? What intervention, small intervention, can I make that I think will nudge things away. And what do I expect if I do that? Engage that, watch what happens, and then learn. So that's applying the scientific method or scientific thinking to leadership itself. And so when I say lead by scientific thinking, again, it's really easy for uh, somebody in charge to just come, come to work every day and just, you know, just react to stuff. But if you actually want to make progress and make it, make it different every day, then you've got to become curious and you've got to be working on what do I want to be different than it is now? Sure. That's no, good. Uh, and I think another, you know, um, Jared Atkins has said, uh, put in a question, can you please give us an example of how you've applied scientific thinking to the people side? Uh, and, and I'd like you to add to that, please. But a, a really simple example is, you know, Mark, you and I have had some conversation to prepare this discussion, but we haven't been here before. So this is an experiment and we mm -hmm. had a prediction and I'm measuring the prediction right now because I'm watching how many people are staying, you know, there's a certain number registered live yeah. And I'm keeping an eye on that number because if that number starts to drop, I know you and I are off track. Yeah. <laughs> so there's an example. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, we're beyond our knowledge threshold. We have a prediction sure. of what was going to happen here, but we were beyond our knowledge threshold. We need to, it is an experiment. We need to monitor that experiment and adjust accordingly. And that's why I'm keeping an, an eye on those numbers. So I think that's an example. But if you've got a specific example where you've, applied scientific thinking in a people situation? I, I'm trying to, I, I, I think, okay, so I was in an organization and their daily meeting was more or less about 
we had a good day or a bad day. That was their morning status meeting. I mean, there's obviously more to it than that, but it really was if there was a bad day and then listing everything bad that happened and assuming that's what caused the bad day. Yeah. And where I wanted them to end up was in a much more detailed discussion, you know, machine by machine, cell by cell, what should, what should, do we expect? What did we get? What happened? But the first step was just to nudge them in the direction of predicting what their output should have been, looking at what their output was, and then really what I wanted them to do was to say, if everything went well, we should have been able to make this. What we actually made was that, and then identify the gap so that they became aware that there was a gap. It just wasn't, it is what it is. That was my yeah. first intervention just to get them thinking in terms of a comparison versus just, ah, eh, we had a good day or not. So they, we gave them a burn down. So every day they knew how many units they had to build. And the question was to make the month. And the question was, did we make that many in the last 24 hours? And if we did, yeah, sure. where are we? So that was a case where I was, making a small nudge, a small change, a small intervention to move them in the direction someplace. And we had to get that behavior anchored before we could get to the next step of yeah. them beginning to segment machine by machine rather than looking at the aggregate. Yes, well, good, thanks. I think, um, and I can give an example where scientific thinking was missing. Recently, I'm working with a guy over on the other side of the world in Ireland, and um, his, challenge was to improve the performance of a maintenance department uh -huh. uh, that were tending to be acting randomly and, and so on and so forth. And what he said he was going to do was he was going to train the maintenance department in a uh, system they called 3M. Yep. He was going to put up a whiteboard and they were going to deploy it and, and that was it. And yeah. I said, uh, so that's worked before with this group of people? And he said, no, it hasn't been done with this group of people. Ah, uh, right. Might that be better considered an experiment? Uh, possibly, because it, well, he's beyond his knowledge threshold. Okay, yeah. so what's the first step that you're going to take? I'm going to do some training. What do you think will happen there? Uh, don't know. All right, there's an experiment. That training that you're going to deliver, you've done it a thousand times, but you've never yeah. done it with this group of people. Yeah. So you don't know, you, you think you know what's going to happen, but you're beyond your knowledge threshold. So yeah. I think that was a case that wasn't being viewed as an experiment. But mm -hmm. actually, in reality, it is, and it, and, and the, the the need for a scientific mindset would need to be it needs to be there. But yeah. I think we overlook that. I think we make an assumption all the time that uh, it's worked. What we've done before has worked, and this is you know what our brain does jumps to the conclusions as Mark um, Mark Rhodes has told us many times, and we miss the opportunity to think scientifically. And I think that's a that's a, I think I think. The number of times we've missed the opportunity to think scientifically is, is an opportunity in itself. That's true. And, you know, even worse is sometimes people will engage in something that actually has been known not to work very well. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I always say, you know, that there are things that don't work every time, but yes. they work better than the things that never work. Yes. And... You know, just to, to riff off of the maintenance thing in another company, uh, they had a really, literally a real-time reader board that was displaying the overall for the whole organization, the OEE, the classic TPM yeah. metric. And I asked the plant manager, what's that for? Well, that's so that the people know, know how they're doing. Well, okay, OEE, first of all, is an aggregation of a half a dozen things. There's nothing actionable in OEE. So... You know, here's putting up the number every day, but it, you know, it's fluctuating randomly, but it isn't, it isn't changing because we aren't running any experiments to change it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was there. Uh, Mark, we've got 10 minutes left. I'm just going to bring up my, um, go back to the presentation. And I'm just going to, I want you to comment on this, please. If I can click it forward. So what, and a lot of the participants I trust will recognize what they see on the oh, left yeah. side, and that's the four step pattern for handling a problem in job relations. And fundamentally that four step pattern you see there is PDCA based, uh, plan, do, check, adjust, or plan, do, check, act, 
determine the objective, get the facts, weigh and decide, mm -hmm. that's planning. Take action is the doing and check results is the checking. And it says at the bottom, did your action help production? Did you accomplish your objective? There's the opportunity to adjust. So one of the, uh, I guess, things that I certainly focus on, maybe not during the training, because I think people learn things linear, linearly better, I know I certainly do, but the reality is this is written down one, two, three, four, and it doesn't show as a cycle, but it is, because the question is, did you accomplish your objective? Now, in my experience, half the time, no, I didn't, but I learned something. So it adjusts your objective and around you go again. So it's not that I want you to comment on, it's really the next slide here. And I think one of the opportunities we miss is, is that uh, I'll go back in the training, we tend to walk out of the training uh, seeing the four step method as a problem handling uh, pattern, if you like. But if you get onto problems early enough, you size them up, it's actually an opportunity handling pattern. And the clues to this, and this ties in with a couple of the questions about you know, how do we do scientific thinking through people, because this is a scientific pattern after yeah. all. And one of the important things here, if we use it for opportunities, not just handling a problem, where it says what possible actions are there, the clues, there it says what possible actions are there, here are the clues, mm -hmm. possible actions are, pick one of those four foundations or a combination of the lot, let each worker know how he or she is doing, give credit when due, tell people in advance. So if we, if we take this as a proactive pattern, not a reactive one, then we've got such an opportunity to apply scientific, a scientific mindset to the uh, development of people and building respect and trust. Can you just comment briefly on that or comment on that? Well, sure. I mean, if you've got a problem, you've probably failed to do one of those four things in some way with someone. Yes. Uh, but the other piece is, again, it's a social system and these are, and we want to deal with people as individuals, but we have to recognize that they're part of a social structure and the social structure itself can be leading to a lot of damaging behavior. Uh, you got to look at, you know, what, what are the rewards? What are the, what, are, what, what, what behavior is encouraged or discouraged even by peer pressure within the organization? Um, and, and, and get the facts. And here's the interesting thing is if I take an action and I don't get what I expected, I got to go back and get more facts because there's something I didn't understand. And you talk about well, the cyclical yeah. nature there. Um, That's right. And by taking that action, whether it be right or wrong or good yeah. or bad, you've actually extracted more facts. Yeah. Yeah. You and, quite often extract more yeah. facts. And I think really the second bullet in step one is where people kind of bleep over. What are the rules and customs? Yes. Yeah. Especially where are there conflicts? A uh, classic case is, you know, I tell my fork truck drivers, you need to slow down. I also tell them, don't be late. Yes. Okay. Which of those two has greater consequences? Yeah. And if he's late with something, um, you know, it's like, you know, we have a pizza delivery company here called Domino's. They used to have, if we don't get your pizza in 30 minutes, the next one is free. They stopped doing that because their drivers are getting into accidents. Um, because their drivers were measured on, on time delivery. Sure. Um, so that's a case where the rules and customs were actually creating pressure to engage in the behavior that you don't want. Yeah. And customs so, are always stronger than rules. Yeah, because customs are the social network. We had, That's right. and, and, you know, one of the first moving lines I, I was involved in, nobody would ever press the line stop button because the line stop button stopped the line <laughs> rather than signaling a problem. And there was yeah. huge peer pressure because they were sick of working overtime. Yes. Yeah, good example. Customs stronger than the rules. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess what... Uh, I think the way I viewed this was what you know, these foundations are the opportunity to apply yeah. what we see here in the bottom right corner. In terms sure. of a tool, you know, people have asked what are the tools, you know, yeah. what tools can I use? This tool here, um, and particularly, oops, sorry, particularly focusing on the, pre the proactive, yeah. how to handle an opportunity, 
this is a tool you can use to develop respect uh, to, to respect yeah. to develop respect to challenge and grow people yeah let's come back around that. Yeah. let's come back around that's right so put your card up again so let each worker know how he or she is doing okay now how can the process itself do that yes Okay, now we're thinking in the way the Toyota way. It's not necessarily the supervisor or the team leader coming by and giving them strokes. It is, I'm on track to make my numbers or I have a problem I need to get help with. How can I embed that information in the very work? Sure. Okay. Um, and that is what creates a situation where people feel competent, they feel connected, and they feel autonomous. And then they go home feeling happier and feeling safe. So if you start threatening that competence feeling, people get scared. Um, and this is where, you know, we really want to pay attention to not just the individual, but the interaction between the individual and the work itself, the interaction between the individual and the other people around them, and the interaction between the individual and their immediate supervisor, because people don't quit companies, they quit their boss. Yes, okay, correct, correct, correct. I guess that ties in with that phrase right down the bottom, um, when you were talking about that interaction of the individual, yeah. people must be treated as individuals. Yeah. That, that ties in with that. Yeah. Mark, we've got, it's uh, 18 minutes to the hour, so that really does probably need to draw us to a close. Uh, as we, as I thought, and I think as you thought, we could, have, we could keep going on a discussion yeah. like this. But Mark, I really appreciate your time and I very much appreciate your insights and I certainly look forward to the day when I'm allowed to travel out of this country and come over and see you again and um, see many of the other people who I appreciate with the, the uh, camaraderie in this community we have going. Uh, but, uh, appreciate your time, Mark, very much. Sure Thank thing. you very much for your insights and um, great discussion. Thank you. Take care. Just a quick reminder, everyone, that you will receive a recording or a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Thank you, Mark and Oscar, for your time. Everyone, have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.